Amen. Open your Bible down to the book of 2 Timothy, chapter number 4. All right, where's that new baby back there, Miss Sherry? Graham, stand up for that thing, our brother. Look at the brand new little baby girl just come. Let's just give her a big hand. Amen. What a blessing. Hey, now, Mamma Sherry will be taking all the help she can get here. Appreciate that. All right. 2 Timothy chapter number 4. This morning, the Apostle Paul, the great Apostle, wrote this last book before he, they cut his head off. I want you to listen to everything I'm going to say this morning because it's going to be important. I'm going to go back in time and I'm going to tell you about some things in my ministry and um, it, some of the high spots. Obviously, we talk about all the, the terrible things. Uh, people keep asking me, when are you going to write a book? And I say, I'm going to wait until right before I die. And I'm going to tell the truth on everybody and then die. And they can read it when I'm gone. How about that? Every one of y'all. You don't mind talking about my faults. Uh, writing a book, brother. Publish it. Uh, and, and I know a bunch of people that would be bad for. Second Timothy chapter number. And uh, I'm sorry. 17. Yeah. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me. And strengthened me. That by me the preaching might be fully known. And that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. From every evil work. And will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom. To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. The title of the message this morning is, Out of the Mouth of the Lion. There's another man in the Bible one time that got through in the den of lions, or uh, in the den of lions. And the Bible said God delivered him from uh, the bite. The angel of the Lord came and shut the mouths of those lions that they couldn't eat Daniel. And that's always an amazing story. I love to hear that story about how the, the angel of the Lord shut the lion's mouth and they couldn't eat Daniel. But then we come over here to Paul. Paul don't say, I was delivered from him. He said, I was delivered out of the lion's mouth. That's close. That's cutting it close right there. And it sounds like he was saying, man, the, the, the lion done had me in his mouth. And I was delivered out of it. That's, 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 that's amazing. That's an amazing thing. Paul had some great things happen in his ministry. But as you study his life, you can't help but notice the great contrast in his ministry. Uh, great and awful. Up and down. Big, little pain, blessing. 2 Corinthians 11, all, all around in there, 2 Corinthians, all the way through there, he said, by good report and evil report, by good things and bad things, as free and yet making many rich, as poor and yet possessing all things. That's a picture of the ministry of the Apostle Paul. That's that's, that's amazing to me. And well, he, he was, he would, one day, one day they were celebrating him when he came into town. The next day they were throwing him in jail. One day they was, they, they called him a sinner and then they changed their mind and said he was a god. And one time they, they uh, was ready to kill him and the next thing they called him Mercury, Mercury, Mercury the chief speaker. So his life and his ministry was full of ups and downs. And buddy, when he come down to the end of this life, he wasn't praying to be delivered from dying. He knew he was going to get his head cut off. He knew it was coming. The Lord showed him. And you know what he said? He said, when all I've been through, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. Whew. That's cutting it close. This morning, I stand before you as a miracle. It is a miracle of God that I'm standing in front of you people here this morning. I do not say that in any kind of bragging at all because I know the Lord is the only thing that's kept me where I am today. It's the Lord. 
He does, and he deserves all the credit. And by the way, if you think about it, he's the only thing that's kept you going. He deserves it all. We deserve nothing. I've had some rough days. I've had some mighty good ones. I was like, when I first started preaching, they, they laughed at me. The people I went to school laughed at me. Uh, I had teachers would make fun of me. And my, the, my high school teacher. I had a boss man while I was working for an insurance company. I, I got saved and I was, uh, I was trying to get my insurance license and work and I was doing all kind of stuff. And, and uh, he said, you going to make a career out of this? And I said, no, nope, I'm going to preach. And he looked at me and said, you a long way from that. And I, I hurt. As I said, I just starting out. And I remember a lot of the things that were said like that. And then I began, began to preach. I'm going to tell you a few stories this morning. And um, I remember when I first started preaching, I remember I got to preach somewhere way off down close to Charlotte one time. And it was real, real cold, about 17, 18 degrees. I had an old Ford uh, Econoline van. You remember that, that was 250, 350, uh, Econoline van. I tried to make it into a, into a, a look, uh, you know, we put carpet inside it and everything. We'd go street preaching with that old van. And I remember that thing wouldn't start. And it was freezing cold. And I mean, it had ice on it. And I, I, was, I was 19 years old, maybe just turned 20. And I got to preach, and the van wouldn't start. And I remember getting out there and pushing that thing, trying to push it down the driveway. And I got uh, uh, one of my neighbors, somebody who had pushed it, and I'd get it going down the hill and then run up here and jump in and, and, and put it down in second gear and catch it. Uh, it's called... You don't, I don't, people don't do that much anymore. If you had a straight drive, you can have, you don't have battery dead or what, you can get them going like that. And I remember I would jump in that thing and put it up in second gear and let the clutch out and it'd start and I'd be gone. I didn't have enough gas to get there. And I borrowed, I went and borrowed from my cousin, I don't know, $5 or something like that. That's back in the good old days for enough gas to drive to Charlotte and preach. And I thought, that's the only way I'm going to get there. i got to beg for the money. I hope and I pray they'll give me, give me something to pay him back. I remember I was determined that I was going to go by the grace of God. I had my brake lines took loose on my car. This guy was trying to get me killed and I was coming off the mountain. I have had knives pulled on me at the flea market preaching. Guy put it, come up, I was on top of the van. This guy come up, big old strong guy. He pulled out a knife about that long. And he looked at me and started sharpening on his boot like that. I looked down. The Bible says. Uh, the Bible says. I, finally, uh, finally, I come down and I shook some people's hand. I stuck my hand out to shake his hand. He said, you better be glad you quit when you did. I can see demons coming out of him. I said, have a nice day, bud. Uh, I just eased on out of there. Uh, now, they didn't do me like Paul. They beat him. I, I mean, I mean, they beat him. Listen, people, you want me to tell you a miracle? I have preached a minimum, a minimum of 15,000 times. There were years, many years, when I preached in 30 river revivals every year out of 52 weeks. And by God's grace, I say this, giving glory to God, 15,000 times, I, as, unless it was back when I first started, and I don't remember it, I have never ever, ever missed one time when I was supposed to preach somewhere. I'm the only preacher I know for, for, for health wise, health sickness. I'm the only preacher that I know that's never had to miss a place to preach. That's a miracle. I can't even understand that. And, and I'm telling you, I'm, there's been planes that were late. There's been uh, revivals canceled because of snow, stuff like that. But I have never, ever called a preacher and said, I don't feel like making it. I, I didn't say I wasn't ever sick. You wasn't listening. As usual, uh, I, I, I said, I have never missed, I've never missed a place. I drove the fever. I drove over Black Mountain one night, took these boys with me, and I was shivering and could not get warm. I mean, I, my throat was so, I know I, I don't know what I had. That's before the coronavirus come out and couldn't blame everything on it. And uh, uh, just a flu. And uh, I remember going over there, and I kept turning the heat up, and them boys said, you're burning us up. I said, I'm freezing to death. And I turned the heat up, and I remember going like that. And I'm, I, I was, oh, it's like that. I couldn't hardly talk. My throat was killing me. And I got up, and I started preaching. And the Lord healed me. 
That's what it felt like. Right in the middle of church, it felt, glory to God, he's healed me. For coming. And as soon as it got up, Lord, I was worse off than I was when I got there. I don't know. I don't know. I drove a minimum, minimum of two million miles in a car. Minimum. I got to counting up one day. If you put 100,000 miles on a car, and I've had 20, I've had, and I've had a lot more than that on, on, uh, on different lines. That's a miracle. It's a miracle of God I ain't got killed somewhere. My daddy told me. My mom told me. I'm telling you, brother, I've been going down the interstate like this, flying in there, and a big concrete wall that high on one side and a tractor trailer just coming over on me like this. And I have to make a split decision. Am I going to back off and maybe somebody won't run into me and let him go? Or am I going to floor it and try to squeeze out that little? And that's what I did. I floored it, went out that little. I've been so sleepy before, but honest before the Lord, I don't know how I got home. Thousands of times. I'm telling you, I, I drove, I was, I was driving up the road one night, and I was looking, I seen this real skinny hitchhiker. I thought, Lord, that's the skinniest guy I've ever seen in my life. And, I, and it was a sign. Oh, I'm not lying. People like that don't need to be out on the highway. I'm telling you, I, I'm telling you, I, I've seen visions. I've seen crazy. I, I went to sleep at the wheel. I, I'm, I'm telling you, it's, it's, been, it's been a trip. One time, we was going to preach. I had to preach for a revival over in the mountains one time. And I took these boys with me. And I had a little bitty Volkswagen Beetle. Y'all remember the old Bo Volkswagen Beetle? I always did like them little things. Had the motor in the back. If you ever, how many of y'all ever had one of them? Remember them? They had the motor in the back, and uh, which made good sense. Rear wheel drive, you know, get a little weight in the back. And you had to open up the little trunk back here to work on the motor. We got up down in the middle of Burnsville somewhere, an hour from Marion. And uh, I was getting ready to come home. And we start, and the, the uh, gas pedal just went to the floor. I said, no, oh, we got problems. I said, this thing, right. one of them got to look at the back. He said, Brother Danny, he said, you, you, uh, you, your cable that runs from your gas feed back to the motor is broke. So it just broke when you missed the, missed the uh, gas pedal. It just went to the floor. I said, oh, Lord, what are we going to do? And they, they, when they it's late at night, nothing open. From Spruce Pine to Burnsville to Marion. When I, when I first started preaching, there wasn't nothing open in Marion but the truck stop that was late at night like that. Everything closed up. And I was talking around there for a minute. And I thought about that. I said, well, what's, ain't nothing wrong with the car. And he said, no. So you can take your finger and go, rear, rear, and, and you can give it gas. You know, that little, little, little thing there. And I said, all right, boys, take your belts off. Everybody took off their belt. This is no lie. We put our belts together and tied it to that gas feed of that car. I said, now, all right, now listen, buddy. You are controlling the gas, my buddy. I said, you yank it. And he yanked, vroom, vroom. I said, now, when I tell you to, you pull it. We was in the mountains, y'all. I put that thing in first gear. I said, all right, ready. Vroom, like no, let up. And I said, no. Yeah, and we went. We come all the way to Marion that night. I'm telling you down the hill. I said, turn it off, you fool. You're going to kill us. Somehow or another, we got all the way home by the grace of God. I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. Amen. I'm telling you, I, I remember, I, it's, been, it's not all been bad. Thank God it, it's not all been good. But thank God it's not all been bad. I drove to Myrtle Beach almost. Florence, the other side of Florence is getting within an hour of something of Myrtle Beach. By myself, that's over 500 miles round trip. I drove all the way down there. Some of my buddy down there, somebody hooked me up. They said, we want you to come preach this church. They brought in a big crowd of young people. I was going to do the message on rock music. That's back when I used slides. I had a projector. I had everything up here. Buddy, I hauled off and did it the best I could. I blasted. I called it everything except cussing. And I, I said, it's wicked. wicked. It's all the devil. And I, I showed them slides and everything. And they... When it was over, they crowded around me up against the wall like this, and they started pointing their fingers and calling me names. And the youth director, some woman was their youth director, and she said, you have no right to judge. The, and I thought, good, not no. The pastor never even spoke to me. Never spoke to me. When it was over, I turned my car around, come right back, drove 300 miles back home. It ain't all been good. It ain't all been bad. Lord have mercy, y'all. I mean, uh, I, I then you turn right around and I go to New York 
and I get off the plane in New York City, and some of my crazy friends up there, they said, come here, Brother Danny. They had a limousine sitting out there. Opened the door, and, like, like I got some kind of slave. I said, y'all are crazy, man. Y'all are a bunch of nuts. So here I am, little redneck hillbilly living Hoppy Tom Holler, riding through New York City in the backseat of a limousine. I thought, I'm going to see what this feels like. Guess what? It didn't feel like nothing. It didn't feel like nothing. It ain't nothing. Feel stupid, really. I mean, uh, I thought, what in the big old area back there? You could put drinks out there, you know, and have mirrors, you know, like a little cabinet have, have, where you could put drinks and stuff. I rode through that thing. I thought, well, let's see what it feels like. The preacher took me up on top of the Empire State Building. He said, You ever been on? I said, Nope, let's go. Uh, we went on top of the Empire State Building. I looked around, and that was before 9 11, and I prophesied in my heart. I looked down there, and I seen all them cars, and all that. And you know what I said? I said, Something awful is going to happen here one of these days. You can't cram that many people in that little bit of space. They place in Manhattan where they're 75,000 per square mile. That's from here out to the interstate almost. 75,000 people stacked on top of each other. No, y'all, Lord, y'all go crazy if I live in a place like that. I feel sorry for you. It ain't no wonder they're, they're crazy and crime ridden and, and stuff like that. It, it was all, they treated me good, they treated me bad. They cussed me. The people call me at night and say, I'm going to kill you. One girl called me one night. She said, I'm going to kill you. I said, all right, go ahead. Uh, she's, and I said, you ain't going to do nothing. One guy called me. He said, I'm coming over to burn your house down. I said, no, you're not. He said, yes, I am. He's drunk. He said, I'm coming to burn your house down. And uh, I've never carried a gun. I'm not saying that's a good idea. Probably, I probably should. I never have. I took one with me on a trip, too, because people uh, talked me into it. But the Lord took care of me out of the mouth of the light. It's amazing. It's a miracle of God that I stand right here this morning. I can't even tell you the bad stuff. I, they took me to Pensacola, Florida one time, and they took me to this fancy restaurant. Y'all that know me, know me that I am not impressed at all with fancy restaurants. Not at all. It really is a waste of money and time. We went up to a big old high building, the Pensacola Bay's out there. He walked in there and the waiters looked like had on black, looked like had on tux and real cloth, tablecloths and everything. They and and we ordered and and I tried to act like I liked it, but I didn't. And I ain't I mean I ain't I ain't, I ain't cut out with junk like that. I, I and uh, they and I went in there and sat down. And I didn't know which fork to use. <laughs> well, I get three or four forks. Use the same fork on everything. Amen. That's the stupidest thing ever. Well, you know, this is what for your salad and this is for your. Well, y'all goes in your mouth and you get them all dirty. But anyway, uh, we started about that time. This guy comes out with a violin. Over my, I said, what in the world are you doing, you nut? They said, that's for the environment. I said, that's okay. Take me to Hardee's. For heaven's sake, Lord, I just want the food. I don't want Tiny Tim or somebody in here. Playing violin over my shoulder. You had to, or you had to listen. When you go to a restaurant and you have to ask for ketchup, you're in the wrong place. I asked for ketchup. They brought me a little thing. It wasn't about this big of ketchup. How are you going to eat French fries? They probably didn't have French fries, baked potatoes. On, when, uh, I, the, you set a ketchup bottle on the on the table. You too fancy for that. Good night. Then I went to Tennessee. You've heard this story. It's a true story. I went and preached youth camp in Tennessee, Chattanooga. On the other side of Chattanooga. You know where Chickamauga Dam is over there, bro? Bet you do. Uh, right near there. Run out in a little youth camp. Big youth camp. Kids running everywhere. They was praying. Our guest speaker, Brother Danny Castle, they said, you got private accommodations, preacher. I said, good, thank you. That's awful nice of you. I don't deserve that. They made me, they got me a little camper. One of them little campers. It looked like a, them at Ricky and Lucy used to have, you know, them look like a bullet. And, and, and uh, about along from, about along from here, the wall right there, the whole thing. If you, when you walk in it, you could feel it. The whole thing would move like it. Had a little bed in there. Had a little bitty bathroom. Honest to goodness, I ain't being ugly. That bathroom, as little as I am, I had to back into it like this. I'm telling you how people get in them little bathrooms like it. It wasn't that wide. And you just had to sort of feel you. Feel the wall back there until you went and sit down. And uh, I went there and, they, and my pastor, 
Brother Ed McAbee, I came out to some the real men of God back in the preached in the 40s and the 30s and the 50s. And they said, when you go somewhere to preach, you take whatever you they give you and keep your mouth shut and thank God for it. And I've always believed that. I still believe that. Still. Uh, you don't deserve now. You ain't no celebrity. Let me preachers listen to me. You ain't no celebrity. Who in the name of the Lord do you think you are? Paul stayed in jail half his ministry. And you think you got to have a five-star motel? You need to get knocked off your high horse, big boy. Ain't nothing wrong with being good to a preacher. Y'all get to me and I love it. I don't take it too good, but I, I appreciate it. Nothing wrong with treating a preacher like, like he's something special. That's all right. But the truth is, you ain't. The truth is, you put your shoes on the same way as everybody else does. The truth is, your breath stinks in the morning just like everybody else does. We're all sinners, saved by grace, and all God's people said. Well, time to go to bed. It was 100 degrees. At least. No air conditioning. It might have had a little one in a while. I laid down. I felt something crawling on me. And it was summertime. I think it's the middle of July. Youth camp time. And, and it's a tick. A little tick. And a little tick ain't going to hurt you. One of them little bitty dark brown ones. And I flicked them off like that. I felt something else. And here's another. My bed had ticks in it. And I remember them men saying, you take what they give you and don't complain. Shut up. It's all right, Lord. I ain't in jail like Paul was. And then I lay down and thought, what if they go, what if they go, in, my, they go in my ears or, and they start hatching out <laughs> eggs and little baby ticks are crawling in my brain. And I, and I, you know, you start imagining stuff like that when you're going to sleep. No, I stuck, I stuck my fingers in my ears and up my nose like this. I plugged up all the holes that I could find and reach. And I said, ain't no ticks getting in here. You might bite me and get out of here, but you ain't going to get in me. And I slept like that. That's the way I slept. You say, brother, daddy, I can't believe you had to go. Listen, the next week I went to New York. I was preaching in New Jersey. And the preacher took me out and he set me out. They picked me up at the airport. Played for the plane ticket. He said, here, they put me in a room, hype as big as this, as big as this, had rooms in it. A motel, like a, is like a, a house. And he said, here's $100, red lobsters next door, eat your supper. And I walked in, I, here I walked in there. See, I wasn't in Tickville no more. <laughs> I was in New York, and they had, back then, four cell phones, had three phones, and I went around using every one of them phones. Every time I called somebody, I'd use a different phone. <laughs> It had a Caduce in it. Uh, you know, that's a big bathtub with uh, that you, you pour it in the water. It's got these squirt of things. I don't, I don't like them things. Y'all call them jac uh, jacuzzi. I don't like them because they make you itch. Anybody made them things? You let them things blow on your back right there, you, you turn red and start itching. That's a weird, that's a weird feeling. But you know, I thought, here I am, laying up here in New York City, New Jersey, eating uh, lobster and steak. And then it don't go too good. I had a fight with a guy. Actually, I just trying to save a guy's life on the interstate over near Chattanooga, Interstate 75. A guy wrecked right in front of us. We had two or three car loads, and I pulled over. I said, Lord, poor fellow wrecked. And I, I went and tried to get him. He come out of swing and hit me right here. I mean, there's trucks going like trucks just flying by there. So, man, you're going to get killed. You're going to kill if you don't. And I tried to hold him back. He must have been on drugs or something. He was knocking that way and that way. And then he jumps over the middle concrete wall going into the traffic over there. And so I jumped over it like that too. And I went over and got him. And I was trying to hold him over here. And we finally held him. The cops come. Ah, stuff like that. I got to thinking on the way home. What kind of idiot? I mean, you know, watch what you're doing, Mark. But yeah, it's in it's in. When you're in the ministry, it's instinctive to help people. Like a doctor. You know, the Hippocratic Oath or whatever it is. I've been sick in Germany. I was in Germany and I had the flu again. <laughs> Lord have mercy. I couldn't, they put me in a house with people I didn't ever met in my life. They couldn't speak a word of English. I couldn't speak a word of German. And I was laying in the bed with the flu. I said, can you get me some Pepto Bismo or something? And they said, 
I said, oh gosh, I'm just going to have to lay here till I die or, or, some, or if I get over this. I stayed in Germany. Carrie went. Carrie went. She had it. Then Chris had it. And both them two, y'all both went with me, didn't you? Remember when we took a trip to Germany? And Chris was about that high. And then she got it on the way back. And is all right. So, <laughs> she got sick on the airplane, flew up on the plane. Plane makes you sick anyway. And I mean, she, and I caught it in my hand. I did. Because that's my kid. You think I'd do that for anybody else? You're out of your mind. <laughs> you can throw you up and die if you're, if you're, I ain't touching nobody's puke. And I caught it in my hand, and people looking, I thought, you shut your, turn around. You don't have no business looking over there, you old hag. That's what I wanted to say. And I, well, we made it back from that trip. Carrie left a $100 leather jacket laying in the airport. I just bought her. And time went on. And I wound up in Hollywood. <laughs> I, I, I said, Brother Danny, try to I said, you should be in Hollywood. I do not want to be in Hollywood. I never want to go to Hollywood again. I've seen enough Hollywood. We went to two or three times. Carrie and Todd went me one time before, he, before they were married. And I think that's when Todd had to sleep in the morgue, ain't it? He, he slept in a, in, in a mortuary with dead people. I'd rather have been in Tickville, brother, than in them Hollywood and, and, a, and a morgue. I'd have been afraid them things start getting up and walking around in there. He slept in there because they, they hadn't got married yet. And we said, we went downtown, give out snacks, went all over Venice Beach where they lift weights. Oh, Lord, Lord. I've seen them. I preached in Haiti and over, over in Ireland and all over the United States. And on top, like I said, I've been up seeing them World Trade Centers and uh, Dallas and Houston and and uh, out west in Colorado. I've been on an airplane coming back from Montana, and it was like a, a three and a half hour flight, and I had a kidney stone, and I'm not certain so bad I couldn't stand it, and I felt like I couldn't sit down, and I was standing up, and she was fussing at me to sit down. I said, I'm hurting. She said, Sit down, sir. I said, Ma'am, I can't. I'm about to die. I mean, for hours like that. And next thing you know, you're on a flight, and they give you a big, nice meal, and it's flat like this, like you can't even tell you're moving. You see, your Christian life ain't always good. But thank God it ain't always bad. You've got to learn how to take it both and say, thank God I ain't in hell and just keep on going. There's two things people will never forgive you for. I told Brother Cain back here a while ago. There's two things people will never forgive you for. One of them is success and the other is failure. I've had both. And people never forgive you for either one of them. They hate you for either one of those. Preachers, over thousands and thousands of people saved. I've got to see thousands walk the aisle. I've had the privilege of seeing hundreds of young people, families put back together, prayers being answered, the Holy Ghost fall, revival spark, come across, start in other churches, move, hallelujah. I wouldn't take nothing for my journey now. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go back and trade it for nobody's life in this world. God's been good to me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. He's been good to me. I still believe the Bible the same way I believe it the day I got saved. I still believe the King James Bible is the final word for all matters of faith and practice for the English speaking people. I still believe the church is the greatest thing on planet earth that Jesus died for and he's coming back after. I still believe we should run buses and bring little boys and girls to church. I still believe that you ought to care and do right and live right and honor God. I still believe right's right and wrong's wrong. I ain't changed my mind a bit. I'm a little nicer, but I ain't changed my mind. I think before I quit, I want to give you a little advice. Take it from old man. You want to live a long life, write these things down or just remember in your head. I'll tell you the best I can tell you. I've been around a long time now. A lot of water's went out of the bridge. I ain't always made an A on my test. But I'm going to give you some advice. These things right quick and I'm through. You want to live a long, healthy life? Number one, you honor your father and your mother. I don't care what they've done. They might have been, you honor your parents. 
I worry about people saying, I ain't never speaking to my mom again. I, I worry about people like, you on dangerous ground. Number two, work. Work hard. Work ain't going to kill you. Work is good for you. You find you a job, brother, and work. It ain't right for a man not to work if he's able. Number three, stay humble. You stay humble. Don't you ever stick your, don't you walk in here or anywhere else like, here I am, everybody. Listen, you stick that head up there far enough, you get it shot off. You better stay humble. Because everything you've got, God gave it to you. Everything you have, the Lord bless you with. None of it's because of our efforts. All because of it. Work hard, stay humble. Number four, see people. See people. What does that mean? Learn how to see people. When you walk in Walmart, don't just well, cry a bunch in here like they're nothing. See people. Some people don't see people. When I pull up to Walmart and there's 150 people walking in and out and everything, and I see a homeless man over there, I see him. You know, Jesus, when he was here, he could have been out there. He's the son of God. Could have been working multitudes of miracles in front of thousands of people. And he saw the woman at the well. And he invested in that one woman at the well and talked to her. Jesus, when he was here, he didn't run around with the big shots. He didn't hang out with all the and all the religious people. He seen that man at the pool of Bethesda like this that couldn't get himself into the pool. Jesus saw people. You see people. You want to live a long, healthy life? Learn how to see people. When you're in traffic, don't say, get out of my way. Why don't they say stupid? Learn how to see people. See that homeless person. See the person. That homeless woman on the street out here is somebody's mama, is somebody's daughter. That woman on drugs out here, they belong to somebody. They are precious to the Lord. People, learn how to see people. Good advice. See somebody struggling in their marriage? See the person, not, not the problem and exalt yourself. Uh, number five, exercise. You've got to. You know, I had, when I had Dr. Ruckman in the car with me one time, and I was in my 20s. And I thought, boy, I hope he likes our church, and I hope he's impressed by what we're doing. And, that. and he said, uh, what are you doing for physical exercise? I said, nothing, really. Well, you know, when you're 20 and 30, you think you're always going to be healthy. I said, nothing. I played ball one, once in a while. I didn't play much at all then. And I thought, why did he say that? And as I got older... I realize, look, people, you have got to exercise. Now, look, now I'm not fussing at nobody. I'm not. If you can't do nothing, look, get you some of them little weights. Little weights are they're two and a half pounds each at Walmart. And if you can't do nothing but this every day, one, two, three, four, five, and, and do 20, 20. And do 20 for a week or two, and then move it up to 30. Remember, I have these little things you squeeze like that, little hand thing you squeeze, you get them at TJ Maxx when you're checking out. And I tell them, and I, every trip I go on, I take them. Like if I'm going to Florida, I take my weights like that, and I do 1,000 with each arm. From here to Florida, I mean, it's all day long. You can do 50, 50, 50. Barely, barely listen to me. If you stop moving, you can't blame it on getting old. You can't, you can't. You, you say, well, my, my back's hurt or my... Legs are hurt, and I know mine is too sometimes. But if you can't move your back, move your arms. If you can't move your arm, move your toes. Stretch. You've got to. You've got to stretch. You've got to bend over. You've got to. You've got to do. You've got to. You can't say, "Well, I'm getting old." I think you're getting lazy. You're getting lazy. Squeeze one of them things a thousand times. You can do it a hundred times going to work. A hundred times going back to work. Coming home. Now, if you have a job where you have to lift and labor, good. Thank God. That's good. But most people don't have them kind of jobs no more. Get you something that you can do like this. Squeeze a ball. Get your rubber ball and just squeeze it. Over and over and over and over and over and over and over. And over. That's for basketball especially. It makes your wrist strong. And you, and you got it. Now, I know, I know you're sitting there saying, yeah, Brother Danny, God's blessed you. And he has. And I thank him for it. I thank him for it. Praise his holy name. But I wouldn't be in this shape right now if I lay around on the couch all the time. 
Come on. I got fat one. And uh, back in the, oh, it's about 1980. I got to eat and travel. And revivals will kill you. Revivals, that's why all the evangelists have to walk like you. I know they're on the level because the bubble's in the middle. And, and, and the, I like, yeah. well, here I'm a man of God. You people are sinning. No, I believe it's you that's sinning, big boy. Well, anyway, I, and the guy come up to me. He's about half crazy. You don't know who I'm talking about. He put his arm around and he said, I just love our pudgy little pastor. I said, all right. <laughs> Bless God, that's going to stop. Move. Move your hands. Move your feet. Do 10 today. Do, here, this is a partial push-up. See, because I ain't laying all the way down like that. That's a, that's a, you can get on like that and it gets harder and harder and harder. I bet some of these guys, Malachi, man, Josh over there, some of y'all, I bet some of y'all can do them one-handed. I ain't never been good on them one-handed push-ups. But you got to have pretty big muscles to do that. And I can do that. But anyway, now here's the part you will like. You got to learn how to eat right. You got to learn how to eat right. I think Brother Derek mentioned in Sunday school, uh, the truth is, You've got to have some vegetables. You have got to have some fruit. If, and, and our diet don't have this no more. You want some advice? Again, go to Walmart or dollar store. You get vitamin D, vitamin E. That's for your heart. Vitamin E, or D3, and zinc is for your immune system. Keep you, and load up on vitamins. Then a little emergency. Laureen got me started on them years ago. And you're, it's like Kool-Aid. You put it in my, drink one of them every morning. Look, for $5 a week. You can prevent tons of, of money spent on sickness. Preventative. Preventative. You're not getting vitamins in your diet. You're not. Listen, I ate at McDonald's. I ate at Taco Bell. Right, they ain't two vitamins in the whole meal. So you have to take supplements. You have to take vitamin E, vitamin C, vitamin D. Your body quits making it. That's what melatonin does. But make you sleep because your body, your body quits producing it after you get a certain age. So you got to make up for it somehow or another. Uh, glucosamine, fish oil. I got bone. When I had that knee surgery 15 years ago, I got bone on bone on that leg right there. No, no cartilage in between. And they said, now this only lasts a few years. But man, I load up on fish oil. That greases them bones up in there where they don't, where it don't hurt. I believe that. And glucosamine and magnesium. Eat. I eat an apple and a banana every day. Almost seven days a week. Every day. And now I, can, I, I now I get to where about 11, 30, 12, I feel like I've missed something if I don't eat apple a banana. Apple a day keeps the corona away. Right. Banana a day makes you feel full so you won't eat so much dinner. Don't make it your goal to see how much you can eat at the buffet. I've done that. I don't get my money's worth back. I know, I've done that. Now, if you ain't going to like this part, you, sometimes you don't eat. Fast. Fasting is scriptural. Fasting is healthy. healthy. Fasting is helpful. Fasting is spiritual. You have got to give this body and your immune system and your stomach muscles and your, your digestive system a rest. You can't keep piling food on it three and four times a day. You'll work it to death. That's why you can't get well if you got a sore or something. Your body has to quit busting up food all the time and go to that sick place and heal it. Understand? Fast. Fast regular. I'm not a long faster, but I've been a regular faster. I'm not bragging. For many, many years. Uh, we're going to get that song. We're going to sing a song here in a minute. Last thing. Don't sin. This is the absolute best advice I could give you. You want to live a long, happy life? Don't sin. The less you sin, the better off you're going to be. It don't matter if you think it's a little sin. It don't matter if you think nobody knows it. It don't matter if you think, well, I'm doing all right in other areas, but I do this, I know it's wrong. I, there's where you mess You're shortening your life. You're shortening your life by sinning. That means don't steal. Don't take nothing that don't rightfully belong to you. Don't cheat people. Don't lie to people. Don't look at wicked stuff. Don't look at nothing on your TV or on your, or your DVD player. Or don't look at anything on your phone that's not right with naked people and cussing and taking God's name in vain. Don't look at it. 
Every time you refuse something like that, you're making yourself healthier. There is scripture that teaches that if you sin less, it benefits you physically. You want some example of that? Look at people that sin a lot. But it show up on you real quick. The old man sitting out there one time. He's out on the courthouse lawn. They was interviewing him. They said, man, how did you live to be so long? Good night. It's amazing. A man at your age. Don't you know that? And he, they said, well, how did you, what's your secret? He said, I drink, get drunk every weekend, chase women, stay up half a night, smoke cigarettes. They said, what? How old are you? He said, 29. <laughs> See, that's, that's what sin will do to you. And you think it won't show up, but it'll show up. Sin will show up. Look at them old hags out there in Hollywood. That's the ugliest people in the world, them old women that sinned all their life. Old retired movie stars. I, I, I don't mean this bad. I don't know nobody in here. Them, them big eyebrows, y'all put, that's, you look like a, you're going trick-or-treating. It's like a clown. I mean, I don't guess there's nothing with messing the eye. But Lord, have mercy. They look like a magic marker. I think, what are you doing? Another subject. But look, don't sin. Don't cuss. Don't cuss. Let no corrupt communicate. You say, well, I work with a bunch of rough people and I have to let one slip every now and then. No, you don't. Ask the Lord to clean your mouth up. Ask Him. Lord, help me speak clean words. You can get mad and fuss at somebody without cussing. Quit cussing! Amen? Stay busy. The last thing I'm saying is you stay in this book. And you stay praying. I'm in my finishing my 107th time in New Testament, my 40 something time in the Old Testament in a few weeks, and I'm not bragging. I'm ashamed of that, really. Should be twice that many at my age. Make it your goal right now to read your Bible and pray and get in the Word of God. The further you stay away from stuff that's wrong, the happier, the healthier, and the more financially blessed you'll be. That's the best advice I could give you. If you're not saved here this morning, come on, girls. We're going to come on. Some of you ladies come up here. Some of our ladies come up. I want to sing uh, God's Been Good. Let's sing that. This is my. Come on, girl. Ladies. Any more of you ladies help me? Um, and I want everybody to sing, but they're going to lead us. And if, you, if God's speaking to you this morning, you say, you know what, preacher? I sure hope I get to live old like you. I'll give you the best advice I can give you. You cut some corners if you want to. I didn't even talk about being faithful to church, witnessing, so I do all of that. Do all that. Witness to a signpost. Give out tracts. Stay busy for God. Wouldn't it be a good time? You want to do something for me for Pastor Appreciation Day? Everybody get on fire for God. Quit fussing and mad at each other and, and your wife, your husbands. and Let's just all rededicate our life this morning. Let's all stand. Father, I pray right now in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray as we come to the end of this service, thank you so much for being to us. And I pray, God, in the days ahead, if there are days ahead for us, Lord, if you want to take us out of here, you can take me out today. I don't know. But God, if we're in the days ahead, God, give us grace to stand for you and live for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is my testimony this morning. Sun's coming ready. Go ahead now. Amen. Amen. Come on. Come on. Come on, ma'am. Come on, young person. Come on, boys. Hey, man, come on, mamas and daddy. Yeah, man. Woo! Yeah, man. You need to get right with God this morning. Come on. Come on, ma'am. Come on. Come on. Get down here. Get down here this morning and say, Lord, I'm going to live for you. I'm going to live for you, Jesus. Come on. No other words can tell me me say. Everybody, everybody. God's been good. Y'all come and pray with her. Amen. Amen. Woo! My life. I've been blessed. Blessed beyond my wildest dreams. As I go to sleep each night. Come on. Oh, I had my share of hard times by my side. He's always stood. Woo! Oh, God's been Go ahead. Sing now. Go ahead now. Has God been good in your life? Go on, just get down here and worship Him and say, Lord, I thank you. You've been good to me. Hallelujah, brother.
God's been good to me. Amen. I've faced my darkest fears. I've had more gains than losses. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Thank the Lord this morning. Everybody. God's been good. Has God been good to you? Let's say it. In my life, Woo! I've been blessed beyond my wildest dreams as I go to sleep each night. Hey! I've had my share of hard times. By my side, he's always stood. Through it all. We're still praying this morning. People still in the altar. Many of y'all have been so good to me, it's embarrassing. My sister over there, Debbie, she's the best sister in the world. Our, my oldest sister, Sandy, died with cancer when she's 40 years old. Just turned 40. And, and it's been Debbie ever since. I wish I had time to read those letters. I didn't get to read all them letters. My Aunt B prophesied them over me. And I didn't even know it. Wrote me a letter when I was about 14 or 15. Said, Danny, y'all got so much talent. Now, I was playing a rock band. And I didn't even know this. And it's at my house right now. She said, God could use y'all and your talent for the Lord. That's what I got to say. I laugh, probably laugh. If you're saved here this morning, it might be because you had some old mama or grandpa or somebody back there praying for you. And that's why we ought to pray for other people. God's been good to us. I've been blessed beyond my life. Go to sleep. Woo! Glory! Had my share of heart. God be good. Amen. Preach King, why don't you come up here and dismiss us in prayer, brother? Uh, I want you all to take your time getting out of here today. As I said, thank you again uh, for all the cards, the letters. Yep. We don't know. You don't know the future. And there ain't nothing we can do about yesterday, last week. I'll tell you what you can do. You can get right and live for God from now on. Ain't nobody stopping you from doing that. I want this brother. He's, he's uh, in, not pastoring right now. And y'all pray for him and his wife. The Lord will open the door wherever he wants him to serve, and whatever he wants him to do. And I'm going to ask him if he will uh, dismiss the prayer. Everybody, don't forget, 6 o'clock is seated. Be back and, and bring somebody with you, okay? All right. Come on, preacher. We are asking you, Heavenly Father, to be a part of that latter-day reign. We're asking you, Heavenly Father, to pour out the Holy Spirit and use your children. Lord Jesus, have something we don't have. And Heavenly Father, we pray that we can tell each and every person about Jesus the Christ. Hundreds of thousands, millions of people have come to Christ. And Father, I praise you for the people that are here before me. I thank you for this brother Danny that preaches the word and been a friend to me over the last number of years. And Heavenly Father, bless each and every one that stands for thee. Put a spiritual hedge